Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, just uh, picking up on some of the comments that uh, the member for Maribyrnong uh, made, um, uh, the issue of the, the viability of the NDIS is something that is very, very important to both sides of the House. And as the father of a disabled child, um, I can say that it is particularly important to me that we get this right. And um, we are getting it right. Uh, we are on the right path to get it right. It is so important. It is too important not to get this right. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is a great force for good all over Australia. It is a once-in-a-generation uh, life-changing initiative. In my work in this place, in speaking to constituents at the four NDIS forums that I've organised in Fisher, and even in my own family, I've seen what a life-changing experience that this scheme is making for some of our society's most vulnerable. Like any powerful force for good, the NDIS is vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. With $22 billion eventually set to flow through the scheme every year, the NDIS is vulnerable to unscrupulous operators more interested in making a profit than in making a difference. Protecting as it does many people in our society who cannot protect themselves, the NDIS has the potential to provide opportunities to those who would cut corners, who do not care, or who would seek to exploit and abuse our most vulnerable. Statistics assembled by Disabled People's Organisations Australia suggest that people with intellectual disability are ten times more likely to experience violence than people without disability. People with intellectual disability are three times more likely to be victims of assault, sexual assault and robbery while 20 per cent of women with a disability report a history of unwanted sex. The institutional risks are particularly high in a scheme which will see a large number of new jobs created in such a short period of time. Over the next five years, the NDIS is expected to create more than 90,000 new full-time equivalent positions. This represents almost a doubling of the existing disability sector workforce and is a terrific benefit of the scheme for all Australians. However, in the years to come, it means that we will be seeing an unprecedented influx of individuals working intimately with people living with disability for the very first time. Individuals without an established history in the sector. The vast majority of those people will do, no doubt, a fantastic job. Many will, no doubt, find their true vocation. However, a small minority will not live up to the standards that we expect and will do their fellow Australians more harm than they will do good. This bill is a major step forward in keeping those individuals out of the NDIS and ensuring that those who we commission to work with our most vulnerable are safe, qualified and therefore there for the right reasons. As I often have said before, as a member of the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS, I must say that the vast majority of participants in the scheme are reporting an exceedingly positive experience. 99,537 people are receiving support for the first time and many thousands of others are receiving more support than they've ever had before. For a great number, getting an NDIS package has been a life-changing experience. In the latest report, quarter to 30 June 2019, 90 per cent of participants in the scheme rated their satisfaction with the NDIS process as good or very good, a figure which has been improving throughout the last three years. By their second year, Almost 80 per cent of participants over the age of 25 in the scheme state that the NDIS has helped them in their daily living. However, we know that everyone's experience is, uh, is not a good one. That's why the, government's, uh, the government amended the NDIS legislation in 2017 and established the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. The government created this commission in close consultation with the states and territories to register and regulate NDIS providers. 
The Commission manages practice standards and a code of conduct has now uh, the responsibility for monitoring compliance, as well as investigating and responding to participant complaints and incidents reported by providers. In addition, the Commission sets key quality policies and provides national oversight in relation to standards and practices in the NDIS. It provides NDIS participants with the potent watchdog they need to deal with any incidents of abuse or neglect. The government showed its commitment to a safe and high-quality NDIS workforce by fully funding the organisation with a budget allocation of $209 million over the forward estimates. Though, as I've mentioned, the experience of most NDIS participants has been very good, what this new NDIS Commission has discovered in the first months of its operation has been, Madam Deputy Speaker, very concerning. In the six months to December 2018, when the NDIS Commission still covered only South Australia and New South Wales, it had already registered 9,801 separate providers covering more than 117,000 participants. During that same six months, a disturbing 1,459 serious incidents and allegations were reported to the Commission. Now, it should be remembered that they, at this point in time, are figures about allegations rather than being uh, proven matters. This included 62 allegations of sexual misconduct, 227 allegations of unlawful con contact, 250 serious injuries and a shocking 496 allegations of abuse or neglect. During that period, the NDIA found it necessary to revoke the registrations of 39 providers for failing to meet the NDIS Code of Conduct. No figures are yet available, of course, for the six months from 1 July 2019, when the Commission began operating in the ACT Northern Territory, Queensland, Tasmania and Victoria. However, at the publication of, as at the publication of the NDIS National Public Dashboard on 30 June 2019, there were a total of 21,510 separate providers registered, providing support to 286,015 participants. At its height, the NDIS is expected to provide services to up to 500,000 people. Sadly, no doubt the number of complaints and reports received by the NDIS Commission will increase with the expanded scale of the delivery workforce. The Prime Minister has responded decisively to the scale of complaints received so far and to the concerns of people living with disability by establishing a Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Critically, he has also secured the buy-in of all state and territory governments so that this will be a meaningful and comprehensive investigation. The Treasurer has allocated $527 million to the completion of this Royal Commission to, to ensure that it has all the resources it needs to get to the bottom of these disturbing reports and to make a real difference for people living with a disability all over this country. I think, like uh, many of us, um, we will have felt mixed emotions this week as the first public hearing of this Royal Commission has got underway. No doubt the process will uncover a great many tragic and confronting personal stories. Our shock and sadness at hearing these stories must be joined with relief that the truth is finally being revealed and resolve that we will learn the lessons that I'm sure thousands of brave individuals and their families are about to teach us. However, the oversight provided by the NDIS Commission and the investigations undertaken by the Royal Commission will ultimately fail to protect people living with disability if we are unable to prevent those individuals who do the wrong thing from providing services again in the future. Worse, without the ability to prevent the, the wrong people from becoming service providers in the first place, we will only continue to see more investigations more inquiries and more revelations of abuse. That is what this bill helps to deliver. In short, this bill will help to ensure that unsuitable people have nowhere to hide in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It will make sure that whatever the service you provide, 
wherever you live, wherever you move, or wherever you work for, or whoever you work for, you cannot escape the consequence of your actions. At present, of course, workers who wish to be registered to provide services under the NDIS are screened. However, they are screened under separate processes designed and delivered by each of the states and territories. Perhaps surprisingly, these regimes are quite different from state to state. In New South Wales, an individual must have a criminal record check. In Victoria, a <coughs> national police check, a proof of identity check and a disability worker exclusion list check. In Queensland, a yellow card, while in Tasmania they must be pre-registered under the Work with Vulnerable Act of 2013. South Australia, the ACT and the Northern Territory have their own systems and legislation. These systems vary in rigour and they vary in some of the detailed exclusions applied. Equally, at present, these screening processes are not valid in more than one state, and in some cases not all of the checks cross state boundaries. If you are registered in the NDIS uh, as a worker in Queensland and you want to work, follow your family to New South Wales, as it stands, you must go through a new NDIS screening process before you can take up your career once more. But more concerningly, if you are rejected in one state or lose your registration, this does not necessarily exclude you from being registered in another state or territory. At the moment, an individual who could not be registered in one state might quite legally be registered in another. At the moment, an individual who has been proven unsuitable in one state might be able to evade the system and take up NDIS employment again by moving to a new, a new jurisdiction. As we have heard, the bill will end these loopholes by establishing the legal framework for a national database to record the results of a nationally consistent approach to NDIS worker screening. The database will keep an up-to-date register of everyone who is cleared to work as an NDIS worker and everyone who has been excluded wherever that exclusion took place. It will ensure that employers can go to one place to check whether an individual is cleared or excluded and help prevent any unsuitable person from being employed. Critically, on an ongoing basis, it will facilitate monitoring of criminal histories to ensure that where a cleared individual uh, commits a, a crime, allegedly, can be swiftly removed from the register if they are clear. Finally, the database will also include the details of the individual's employer so that employers can be immediately informed when one of their staff becomes ineligible to provide NDIS services. Madam Deputy Speaker, all of our states and territories have agreed through the COAG process to introduce a nationally consistent check because they recognise, as the Morrison government does, that the protection of people with disability from violence, abuse and neglect is a key priority for us all. The check will be introduced in each state and territory over the next year. The national database enshrined in the bill before us is a missing piece in the puzzle. It will significantly improve the national NDIS worker screening program that we need to minimise harm to people with disability and to ensure that they can feel safe. Madam Deputy Speaker, no program like the NDIS, this is a groundbreaking piece of legislation. This is a groundbreaking uh, uh, program that all members in this place, and in fact all Australians, should feel proud that we are giving people who are living with a disability the opportunity to lead fulfilling lives. People who live with a disability are just like you and me. They want to get up in the morning, they want to have families, they want to go to work, they want to contribute to society, they want to play sport. What the NDIS does is not charity. It is a scheme sponsored by all of Australians to enable all of Australians who live with a disability to, uh, to come together and lead fulfilling lives. That's all they want. They're entitled to that. Uh, and, and 
I'm very proud to be part of a government that is delivering that for them, and I commend the bill to the House. Yeah.